Hey. Hello and welcome. I hope your reInvent is off to a great start. My name is Chanu Damarla, and I'm a principal product manager with AWS Analytics. And in this session, we'll talk about how to build an end-to-end -end data strategy for analytics and generative AI. We will start. We will start with an overview of why you need an end-to-end -end data strategy. Then we will talk about how AWS can help you build this end-to-end -end data strategy. Then I will turn it over to Ram, who will show you a demo of some of the innovations we talk about in this session. And finally, we'll turn it over to Karen, our friend and guest from Fannie Mae, who will talk about how Fannie Mae built their end-to-end -end data strategy on AWS. Now, we're presenting on a Monday, and there are a lot of great sessions ahead of us this week. So where possible, I'm going to include a call out at the bottom of the screen about interesting sessions that are relevant to what we're talking about on that slide. For example, this call out is recommending you to tune in to Swami's keynote, where he will talk about the innovations in our databases, analytics, machine learning, and generative AI sessions. Let's dive right in and start <clears throat> and talk about why we need an end-to-end -end data strategy. It's so easy, especially this year, to focus in on that new generative AI application, the increasingly accurate machine learning models, or the insightful dashboard that we miss the proverbial iceberg. These generative AI applications, machine learning models, and dashboards are built on solid data foundations. This is where the complexity is, and this is where the hard work is. And building a solid data foundation for your company is the first step in deriving value and insights from your data. Unfortunately, sometimes this can be challenging because you have to break down the silos that exist in your organization. You may need to break down the data silos where your data lives across disparate databases, data warehouses, data lakes, and even third-party systems like Salesforce or SAP. You may need to break down people silos by making the data and analytics self-service so it's easily accessible to everyone inside your organization, including your less technical people in your organization. And finally, you may need to break down business barriers that prevent cross-account, cross-organization data sharing due to compliance issues or cost attribution. To overcome these challenges, companies of all shapes and sizes are building decentralized end-to-end -end data strategies that let data producers with the domain expertise build and share curated data products across their organization. These curated data products are then utilized by data consumers who understand business priorities and use these data products to drive business results. And helping coordinate the data producers and the data consumers is a data foundations team that is responsible for selecting and deploying the tools that enable the various stakeholders to easily share data. Now, of course, all the sharing has to be governed in order to ensure uh, that organizations comply with applicable regulations. To implement this strategy, customers often use a multi-account architecture on AWS. Data producers use separate accounts to isolate data products from each other. And increasingly, we see data producers using separate accounts to manage the cost of creating a data product separately from the cost of sharing that data product across the or entire organization. In addition, data producers are responsible for their own infrastructure and for meeting business-defined SLAs around data timeliness and data quality. To facilitate the sharing of these data products across the organization, the foundations team typically provides discovery tools like a business data catalog, tools for management, and they are responsible for defining the governance, auditing, and compliance requirements for the entire organization. Then consumers can now discover and subscribe to these data assets, and they use them to build analytics.
machine learning models, or applications. To help you build your end-to-end -end data strategy, AWS offers a comprehensive set of purpose-built services for a variety of use cases, optimized for cost and performance. And many of our services support multiple deployment options, so you can get started quickly by using a serverless option, or you can optimize the cost performance of your workloads by running on pre-provisioned compute, Kubernetes, <coughs> spot instances, or reserved instances. Now, you may be wondering, do I really need a comprehensive set of tools? And as anyone wearing the wrong size shoes this week will find out, one size truly does not fit all. Look, joking aside, a database is not appropriate for every use case, just like a data warehouse is not appropriate for every use case, just like even a data lake is not appropriate for every use case. And in fact, in our experience, it's common for customers to start with one service or an architectural approach, and then as they understand their workload and the usage patterns for that particular application, to switch to another service or another architectural approach because it is better suited for the task. For example, they may start off with a relational database because they understand it and they can get started with it quickly, but then switch to a non-relational key value store because it is a better fit for their use case and allows them to really fine tune the cost performance profile for their applications. And to support customers, AWS provides a comprehensive set of services to help them store and utilize data, to help them integrate the data across their organization so they can create a, so they have visibility into their entire business and customers, and to help them govern their data assets so they can comply with their regulatory obligations. Let's dive in and take a look at some of the services we provide to help you store and utilize your data. In addition to S3, our durable object store, we offer the industry's most complete set of relational databases such as Aurora and purpose-built databases like DynamoDB, a scalable key value store, Neptune, a graph database, and TimeStream, a database purpose-built for your time series data. These databases are uniquely designed to provide optimal price performance for their respective use cases so developers always have the right tool for their job. Aurora is our MySQL and Postgres, Postgres compatible relational database service designed for unparalleled performance, including scalability, availability, and reliability, all at one-tenth the cost of commercial grade, of enterprise commercial grade databases. Now, it's hard to talk about all the innovations with Aurora or any of the services I'll mention in this talk but I do want to highlight some recent launches from our services that are helping break down data silos inside organizations. And one such Aurora launch is the Aurora MySQL to Redshift Zero ETL integration, which seamlessly replicates data in Aurora into Redshift in seconds. In fact, P50 is less than 15 seconds. So customers can use Redshift for near real-time analytics on petabyte scale data. And the best part is you don't have to do anything to set up this data integration pipeline. You simply tell us the tables you want to replicate into Redshift, and we take care of everything seamlessly in the background for you. In addition to the database services, AWS offers a comprehensive set of analytics services and many of these services offer a serverless option so you can get started with them quickly to build your applications. For data warehousing, we offer Redshift. Now the beauty of Redshift is in the scale of data it can operate on with consistently high performance while keeping your costs predictable. Redshift today offers 7.9 times the price performance compared to other cloud data warehouses and we will continue to innovate in this area. Redshift is the only cloud data warehouse that lets you run queries at exabyte scale against your data lake, 
as well as petabyte scale inside your data, inside your clusters. In addition, with Redshift's federated query capabilities, customers can now query their operational data stores like Aurora or RDS. And as data becomes more democratized within organizations, Redshift is delivering on easy analytics for everyone. A recent launch in this area I want to highlight is the autocomplete and syntax highlighting feature in Redshift's Query Editor v2. This feature enables less technical users in an organization to build analytics and queries more efficiently and accurately. Embedding machine learning and generative AI capabilities into our services to empower all users is a theme you will hear about in many of the deep dive sessions this week. For big data processing, we offer EMR. <coughs> EMR makes it easy to run big data processing frameworks like Spark, Hive, Presto, or Flink. It supports the latest versions of these open source frameworks within 90 days, and it provides the best performance at lowest cost. In fact, Spark workloads run five times faster than open source. In addition, EMR has flexible deployment options like serverless, Kubernetes, or running on provisioned compute. And by running on spot or reserved instances, you can save 50 to 80%. A recent EMR launch that I want to highlight, it's fine-grained access control with lake formation permissions for Spark jobs. This feature makes it easy to share data across your organization. So instead of creating different versions of the same table that you then share with different user groups that have different permissions on that table, you can now use table, column, and row level permissions to share just the portions of that table with the appropriate users inside your organization. Be sure and check it out. For business intelligence and dashboarding, we offer QuickSight, which allows everyone in your organization to understand your data by asking questions in natural language using QuickSight Q. Explore your data through interactive dashboards or look for outliers in your data powered by machine learning. QuickSight enables business intelligence for everybody. And with QuickSight embedded dashboards, these insights can now be embedded directly into your operational tools and internal portals so your users have access to the data that they need with the appropriate business context. For example, Bolt uses embedded dashboards to share deeper insights into how shoppers with Bolt accounts compare with guest shoppers. And of course, because these are interactive dashboards, it's always possible to drill into the details as required for your use case. Now, to support your interactive log analytics, real-time application monitoring, and website use cases, we opt for Open Search Service. It is a fully managed service that makes it easy to operate, <coughs> deploy, operate, and scale Open Search clusters on AWS. Customers use Open Search, for example, for log analytics so they can detect potential threats and respond to changes in system state, all through an open source solution for observability. Like many of our services, open search lets you fine tune the cost performance profile of your workloads. Now, we know that the costs of log and application data increase as the data grows. And with open search service, you can use different storage tiers to optimize the cost performance of your workloads. For example, you can keep your highest priority workloads on hot storage for fast performance while moving <coughs> the data for your lower priority workloads to cold storage in order to optimize costs. With all the interest in generative AI, a recent open search feature that I want to highlight is the vector engine for open search server serverless. To speed up searching across all the unstructured, semi-structured, and structured data in an organization, Open Search uses a data structure called an index. At a very high level, you can think of an index 
<coughs> as an index keeps a list of all the documents that contain a specific word. Like, these are all the documents that contain the word restaurant. However, what if there are documents that contain words similar to restaurant, like diner or cafeteria or steakhouse or pizzeria? How do you find these documents when you search for a restaurant? To group these documents together, you can use embeddings. And you can think of an embedding as a mathematical signature for documents that allows you to find documents about the same concepts, even if those documents don't contain the exact same words. And with the vector engine, developers can now search across their structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data using descriptive text and metadata like they're doing right now, as well as search against these embeddings. Customers can use this capability to not only improve the search results and the relevance of those search results, but to create personalized responses in generative AI applications by finding all the data within their organization about a specific customer, a business, or a specific topic, and use that information to create the prompts to feed the large language models. To support your machine learning workloads, we offer a broad set of machine learning capabilities, from support for deep learning frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow, to services like Amazon SageMaker that makes it easy to create your own machine learning model or AI-powered applications, to AI services with built-in machine learning capabilities like Transcribe to power, that can power your speech-to-text use cases, or Textract that can extract text, handwriting, and data from your scanned documents. Now, of course, many of our customers are interested in how generative AI can help transform their business, and to support these customers, we offer Bedrock. Bedrock is a fully managed service that makes it easy to build and scale generative AI applications for your, with your choice of high-performing foundation models, all while maintaining privacy and security. Bedrock includes all the capabilities you need to build <clears throat> generative AI applications and experiment with foundation models, customize foundation models with your private data, and create agents that can execute business tasks like booking travel or creating an ad campaign. Some of the foundation models that Bedrock supports includes Claude 2 from Entropic, Llama from Meta, and Titan from Amazon. So far, we've reviewed the services we provide to help you store and utilize the data inside your organization. Now, let's dig into the services we provide to help you integrate your data. Let's start by discussing why data integration is important. Data integration is important because your data lives in disparate databases, data warehouses, data lakes, and SaaS systems in your organization. And you need to integrate this data together to create a holistic picture of your business and customers. Often, this involves developing code to clean and transform your data, developing code to replicate or move data between systems, as well as orchestrating end-to-end -end workflows. For example, you may want to manage dependencies, like only run this aggregation step once all the data has been loaded into Redshift. And so to help you prepare your data, we offer use case specific data integration services. For example, to help you migrate data from open source and commercial databases into your data lakes and data warehouses, we offer the database migration service. And if you want to purchase third party data sets to augment and enrich your data, then you can use Data Exchange, a marketplace where you can access over 3,500 data sets from over 300 customers. And finally, for orchestration and workflow management, we offer Amazon Managed Apache Airflow, as well as Step Functions. And of course, Glue. Glue is our anchor data integration service, and it features a serverless execution engine that can scale to support all your workloads. 
Glue supports all the users inside your organization with persona-specific authoring tools. Notebooks for your technical users, Databrew for users that want an Excel-style wrangling interface, and Glue Studio for users that want a visual job authoring experience for developing your data integration pipelines and data integration jobs. A recent Glue launch that I want to highlight is the ETL AI Coding Assistant powered by Code Whisperer. Using this feature, users can build data integration pipelines using natural language input. In this example, just by putting in that comment, write data frame into Redshift, Code Whisperer will give you the Spark code for writing a Spark data frame into Redshift. While tools like this will simplify the development of data integration pipelines, in many cases, we can do better. And that's why we're investing in a zero ETL future. Zero ETL eliminates the need for ETL pipelines that you were previously building and managing by hand. And in many ways, this is similar to how we use the term serverless. Right? Serverless doesn't mean that there are no servers. It means that we, AWS, removed the undifferentiated heavy lifting of provisioning, monitoring, and deprovisioning servers so you could focus on your business logic. And in a similar way, as we progress on the zero ETL journey, we will, remove, we will evolve our offerings to remove much of the undifferentiated heavy lifting of building, monitoring, and managing data integration pipelines so you can focus on your business-specific transformations. And in practice, what this means is that we will invest in making it easier for you to access data in place by expanding the federated query capabilities in Athena and Redshift. Spectrum, and Redshift. So instead of building a pipeline to replicate data from your operational data stores into your data warehouses or data lakes so you can query them, there's no need to move the data. You can query the data directly in place. We will also move machine learning and analytics closer to where the data resides. For example, many of our data services, including Aurora, Redshift, QuickSight, and Neptune, have integrated machine learning capabilities in them already. And just yesterday, Redshift announced the ability to access large language models in SageMaker Jumpstart from SQL. And finally, we'll build point-to-point -point integrations between our services so we take care of the undifferentiated heavy lifting of moving and replicating data between our services so you don't have to. This is similar to the Aurora MySQL to Redshift Zero ETL integration that I covered previously. Now, let's review the tools we help we provide to help you govern access to your data. So far, we've talked in detail about the tools we provide to help data producers create curated data sets. And we've talked in great detail about the tools we provide to help data consumers utilize these data sets to create interactive dashboards, data integration pipelines, and so forth. But without the governance foundations in place, these data sharing data across your organization will be a difficult task. And as recent GDPR and CCPA fines have shown, governance cannot be an afterthought, right? A proper data governance framework is critical because it helps you move faster with data while complying with your regulatory obligations. And to support you, many of our tools already have built-in governance capabilities. For example, SageMaker, helps you address common machine learning challenges from onboarding new users to centralizing model information for multiple users in a single location. To govern your data lakes, we provide lake formation, which helps you easily build, govern, and audit your S3-based data lakes. And it <clears throat> features table, column, and row level permissions so you can share the right data with the right users inside your organization. And for true end-to-end -end data governance across your entire organization and all of our services, we offer DataZone. DataZone provides the key components required to share data products across your organization. It includes a organization-wide business data catalog where, user, where data producers can publish data assets. 
Data consumers can then discover these ac data assets and request permissions to access them. And once that subscription has been approved or those per the permissions have been granted, Data Zone sets up all the permissions, including cross-account permissions for you, seamlessly in the background, so, the cons so your consumers can just access the data. Data Zone is a new service. We just GA'd it in October. And if you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to learn more about it this week. It really is the connectivity tissue. It provides a lot of the connectivity tissue to build an end-to-end -end data strategy on AWS. That was a quick overview of our <laughs> why you need a data end-to-end -end data strategy, as well as some of the services we provide to help you build your end-to-end -end data strategy. Now I will hand it over to Ram, who will walk through a demo of how to build end-to-end -end systems on AWS using some of the innovations we just talked about. Ram? Thanks, Shanu. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ram Kumar Notath. I go by Ram. I'm a principal solutions architect at AWS focusing on analytics and machine learning services. In the next 10 minutes, I want to show you how you can build or use the innovations that Chanu talked about to build an end-to-end -end system in AWS. So let's assume that you have a touring company and you want to build a system or a chatbot to help your customers to answer questions, personalize suggestions, based on the trip booking information that you have. To build that chatbot, first, I want to show you how you can curate that data set by bringing in the data from operational systems like Aurora MySQL to your data warehouse, which is Redshift. And then, let's go ahead and share that data with the organization because there are consumers who want to consume that data. And once that is done, we want to build that chatbot using the curated data set. Now, with, for all these demos, I will leave some links where you can refer and go in detail. And there are some workshops that are available where you can get your hands dirty and try out that portion of this demo. So let's get started. So the first, we are going to curate the data set. So here, we will start by setting up zero ETL between Aurora to Redshift MySQL, where I have my user details present in the user profile table and the hotel booking details present in the hotel booking table. Now, earlier you would have thought about building a custom pipeline, deploying it, maintaining it, whatnot, right? Now you don't have to do that. You can just set up zero ETL between these two systems so that you can replicate that data. All what you need to do is provide the source database from where you want the data to be replicated and, where you want on the, and the target where you want the data to go and rest is taken care by us. Let's take a look. So we'll start by going to Aurora console. So here you can see the travel DB database. That's, where, that's my Aurora database, which is a serverless variant there. And I have the hotel booking information coming in here. All the transactions are happening against that. So now let's move to the zero ETL integration. And let's scroll down and click on create zero ETL integration. Let's give that a name. Let's say travel zero ETL and click next. And now we are configuring the source data. So we'll click there and select our travel DB database, which is our MySQL database. And once it is done, the next step is to configure the target database. So here you can browse the Redshift data warehouses that you have. And in our case, we have a Redshift endpoint that is available. So let's go ahead and select that, Redshift Gen AI namespace. And once we ch uh, that is chosen, the next activity is to select some uh, tags. If you want to add tags, you can add that. But for now, we'll skip that. And let's review everything. Let's go ahead and hit Create Zero ETL Integration. Now, you can see that the status got changed to creating. This typically takes a few minutes for us to save some time. I've cut that. Portion. And you can see that it is going, going to the target is Redshift Serverless Endpoint. Now, once it is created, you will see the status as active. The integration is done. 
Now, what you need to do is, let's, let's go to our target, which is the Redshift query editor. Let's go ahead and find out what is the integration ID, because all what we need to do is create a database using that integration that we just created. So we are getting the integration ID from the system tables. And using that integration ID, we are going to create a database in Redshift. Let's call it as Travel Zero ETL or Trip Data Zero ETL, right? That was it. Now your users have access to data in your target environment. Let's go ahead and take a look. Yes, you can see the Trip Data Zero ETL database. If you drill down, you'll be able to see the trip schema. And within that, there are two different tables that we were talking about, which is the user profile and hotel booking information. Now let's go ahead and query that. Let's make sure that we have access to that data. So user profile looks good. Let's do the same for hotel booking table. Let's go ahead and query that. There you go. So we have the data available. Now compare this with a custom pipeline that you would have built. How amazing it is, right? Now, let's move on. Let's take a look at how we can share this data across organization. So for that, we will start by publishing the data using, uh, using Amazon Data Zone so that rest of the users in your organization can search for it, consume that data, and use that data. Now, this part of the demo assumes that you have your Data Zone set up and the environment up and running. So if in case you are interested in knowing more about those details, please, please take a look at the AND313 session. There you will have a lot more details in the, the workshop. Now, just to let you know, here I have logged in into two different um, browsers because we are talking about two personas, right? A producer and a consumer. Now, producer is the, the person who is publishing or the team who is publishing the data. And you have the consumer who is requesting for the data or searching for the data, finding it out, sending a request, and consuming that data. So I've put a call out at the top so that you have an idea whether I'm on the producer screen or the consumer screen. Now, because I'm part of the producer team, I have access to the data zone project, which is the customer publisher project. Okay. Now, I have the data source available. Let's go to that specific data source and collect the metadata or bring in the metadata from the systems by clicking that run button. Once that run is over, it is importing all the metadata from the Redshift database. You can see the user profile and hotel booking table from there. Now, our inventory is done. So let's go to the inventory section. And you can see both the tables there. Let's select the user profile data. And here you can see the metadata that is automatically generated by Data Zone for you. So you can take a look at it. You can make edits if required. But for me, everything looks good. So let's go ahead and accept all. Now, inventory is done. We validated the metadata. Now let's go ahead and publish it. So let's go to that specific data set and click Publish as set. And let's go ahead and confirm. Yes, go ahead and publish this. That's all you need to do for your data to be visible or available for your business data catalog so that other users can search for it and consume it. Now, this time we are moving to consumer. So as a consumer, Again, they have an environment available, and you can see that it's a Redshift environment that they are going to work with. So the first thing that consumer is going to do is search for that data asset. So they search for user profile information. So they saw that published data set. Everything looks good. This is the data set I want. Let's go ahead and subscribe. Let's hit that subscribe button. Provide a reason for the request, why we are requesting access to this data set, and hit subscribe. Now, this starts a workflow because now there is a request being sent to the producer that, hey, there is a consumer who wants to access this data. Let's now go to producer because now producer has to act on it, right? So at the producer side, you will see that, hey, there's a notification that a subscriber has requested for this data. So producer takes a look at it, and if everything looks good, put that decision comment and approve it. Now, that's all producer has to do. Behind the scenes, Data Zone is doing all the permissioning that is needed so that the consumer has access to this data from their environment. So let's go to the consumer and take a look at that. So you can see that in the subscribed data on the consumer side, the user profile is listed. And we are going to the consumer's Redshift environment to see if we are able to see that data and query that data. 
So there is a view that is available now because it's at the consumer side. So they are using consumer compute, consumer Redshift cluster, and querying against that view to get the access to that data. Now you can work with this, you can analyze, you can do all the other activities that you want to perform on this. Now, what I want to highlight here is, think about how easy it was as a publisher to publish a data set, as well as as a consumer, to search for the data that you are looking for and get access to it and start using it, right? Now let's build that generative AI chatbot. So in this demo, we are using the data from the data that we have curated to power a generative AI application. So we are going to build a travel planning assistant chatbot, so it, which takes the user input and use that to go against Redshift query the data that it, is, it needs, and then go against Amazon Bedrock, which will call a large language model, cloud large language model, and pass all that information to provide personalized suggestions for this user. Let's take a look. So here we are on the, the Redshift query editor. This time, we want to look at specifically on a, on a specific user because we want to understand what is their interest? What is a hotel booking schedule looking like? And all of those details. So here, there is a user ID there. Let's go ahead and query. So you can see that Blake uh, likes quilting, ice skating, and uh, tabletop games. And the favorite food is macarons, waffles, and pudding. Okay. Now, let's look at the, the hotel reservations. Looks like there is an upcoming trip in June to Manchester, Brussels, and Paris. Now, let's go to our chatbot. The first thing that chatbot is looking for is a user ID. So let's provide the user ID of Blake. Because at this time, what it is doing is it is going against Redshift and getting all the information that we just looked at so that anytime the user asks a question, it can pass that additional context so that large language model can provide personalized suggestion. So Blake is asking, hey, can you help me with the a travel itinerary for my upcoming travel. So you can see the suggestions that are coming up. So now if you look at it, it considered each one of the cities that Blake was traveling and the respective dates in the suggestions. And after that, within each one of those itineraries, it looked at tabletop games, for example. It provides suggestions for skating and love for waffle. And how can we miss some macarons in Paris, right? So that's how it is. How about if Blake wants to do a trip in US? Now, this time model understands that, hey, user is asking this question, but they don't have a booking information for that particular date or that location. So it still provides an answer, but this time, instead of specific dates from the, the table, it is giving its suggestions as well as the, the very specific interest of the user. Now, in the last 12 minutes or so, we looked at how you can build end-to-end -end systems using databases, analytics, and machine learning services in AWS. Keeping the environment setup aside, we spent almost three minutes in share, creating a zero ETL integration between, between your transactional databases and your data warehouse. And less than three minutes to publish a data set, share that, and consume it from a sharing standpoint. And then we also looked at how we can use the data that we curated to power a generative AI application. So with that said, I will hand it over to Kiran. Thanks, Chanu and uh, Ram. Uh, it's a, you know, I mean, basically, I'm really glad they laid out the foundational stuff um, of what, why end-to-end data, end data strategy is needed. Yeah? I'm Kiran Ramineni, um, Vice President for Single Family Architecture, uh, Cloud Data and Infrastructure at Fannie Mae. Um, as you all uh, seen, data strategy has to be inclusive and end-to-end. -end, yeah? um, I'm here, I'm thrilled to be here to share our journey into data mesh and insights uh, we have learned uh, during the journey 
um, as, uh, as it applies to financial sector. Yeah? Um, speaking of financial sector, uh, probably all are familiar with what Fannie Mae does. Yeah? So we cons basically, um, we are one of the most valued housing partner. We facilitate equitable, sustainable access to home, house ownership, homing on, ho sorry, house ownership, quality affordable rental housing across America. To kind of put that in perspective, right? Um, you know, uh, in 2021, 2021 and 20, um, we facilitated around 1.4 trillion US dollars of liquidity into the market. So kind of uh, one in four homes uh, mortgage is facilitated by F Fannie Mae. Yeah. Um, so now, uh, how does it relate to you? So when you talk about data, think about all the data you have provided during your mortgage uh, origina loan origination to loan servicing, the whole nine yards. All the data, we host all the data. And now think about everyone, uh, one in four homes who uh, we are facilitating their mortgage and loan and their, uh, servicing their loans. Yeah? Um, or, um, so all that, plenty of petabytes of data we host. Yeah? Now let's talk about data. Um, traditionally, um, organizations struggle with integrated, um, with elusive integrated data experience. Um, and uh, the, the fundamental reason is the approach the organization have taken. Typically, you see that as a technical issue. And you see, qu quite often, you see people referring to uh, data asset. There lies the problem. See, data is an enabler of a business capability, not an asset. That's the shift, if you will. And if you look at um, where we all evolved from, the first generation of our data platforms, essentially you take data, operational data, and you dump it into data warehouses. That's the first generation of data platforms. And the second is uh, uh, basically without ETL, you dump into um, something like Hadoop. Um, and leverage and extract data out of it. And the third is, is where you are a single account where you take all the data, do some ETL, and dump it into a single account um, in AWS, if you will. If you look at all those things, there is a, a fundamental issue there, the one that Chanu was referring to, one size fits all. Your data needs vary by the data domain, you are in, business domain you are in and the persona that leverages that data to, ge to generate, to empower business capabilities. Yeah? That's where we, you know, like any other company, Fannie Mae also evolved uh, from that particular approach, where you're in a single, single account, third, third generation data platform. All data in one place, in data warehouse, obviously, you know, you would step on, your queries will step on someone else. Um, and there's resource exhaustion issue. That's when we went into uh, multi-account-based structure. Yeah? Basically, um, so the way, the way Fannie Mae approached, I mean, we realized this way in end of 2020, Q4 of 2020, where uh, we uh, realized, hey, we need a more um, integrated experience, improve our data integrated experience. Yeah? Um, and we approached that as a, um, social we took a more uh, social technical approach to it. Yeah? The word social technical systems is not new. It's actually coined way back during World War era for coal mining. Basically, safety and soundness is very important coal mining. The process you follow to realize the value is very important. The same thing applies to data as well. You're realizing value out of the data. Yeah? And if you apply that people process technology issue to data, it translates to ownership, business domain driven, their business data ownership, domain data ownership, yeah? Um, and data is a product and not as an asset, if you will. And self-service, basically when you need data, you need it. 
and, uh, and centralizing that, uh, that uh, intent of provisioning data access slows you down. And it affects your uh, uh, time to market. So basically, uh, and the next thing comes in is safety and soundness is important. If you make it centralized, it slows you down again. It impacts your time to market. That's where you know, federated governance come, makes a, um, it's very important. Yeah. So Fannie Mae uh, took this approach and we went into multi-account uh, structure. What you're seeing here is, we, we went, we, there are several ways to achieve data mesh uh, as a principle, if you will, but we took more of a hub and spoke kind of model. So what you're seeing on the extreme left is business domain accounts the spokes are the, where you host your business domain data. When I say data, it's a complete data, compute, and infrastructure all together. They're all co-located. Yeah? Um, you don't want to unnecessarily move the data around. That's going to create latency and is going to impact your completeness and uh, timeliness. The whole idea is they're all co-located. Yeah? But there's a central function of governance and enforcement of these controls, data quality checks, data ingestion controls. So th there is a central governance function. By the way, make no mistake, when I mean by central, it's centralized cohesive control plane, but actual execution, the execution plane and data movement plane is all on the this, on this spokes. Yeah? So think of that as a control plane and distributed data and execution plane. So that's where, then the, there's extreme right you're seeing end users. Their needs are completely different from your typical business application capabilities. That's where the end user, where the, the data scientists, ad hoc uh, business intelligence reports, um, and, and experimentation, Greenfield. Yeah? So that's where you, know, you see a completely different uh, spokes for that. Now, let's apply the two on the tech, uh, what it means on the technology side. So what you're seeing is a, an, a, one or more account for business domain. We don't restrict by um, uh, one account to one domain. You can have more than one account, if you will. It's horizontally scalable. So you have a business product specific operational account where all your operational data is, and compute is hosted and the data is ingested in near real time into the, into the spoke of the enterprise data lake. And you think of that as a mesh of lakes, yeah? And in real time, in near real time. And what you're seeing is the central data mesh governance. Essentially, that's, the, that's where all the, the central services are hosted to manage the, to, to provide the needed controls to enforce data quality, data ingestion, and data movement. Um, and also host the uh, data catalog to be able to discover your data, yeah? So essentially, business units manage their own code and infrastructure. It's self-service based, and we have an enterprise data catalog. So one of the things you'll realize is as you mature into this uh, multi-account based structure and start migrating data cloud, you will end up with thousands of data sets. Yeah? So now, discovering this data and the relationship between the data becomes a challenge. That's where you know, they send a, a data catalog, which is again federated into each other's spokes, but has a cohesive control plane in the central data mesh, in the, in the hub, is, is, becomes essential. Yeah? Now, on the extreme right, data, the insights. You're executing insights, you're, you're a data scientist, your business reporting, now they have a cohesive integrated data experience. Yeah. So here's the recommendations for um, data modeling and domain owners. So there's the two terms I'm going to introduce, data as product and data products. Yeah. Data as product is basically bringing product discipline to your data. What, capable, what business capabilities is it providing? The infrastructure and code all together. Yeah? Data products is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is something that provides or empowers a K 
capability. So what you're seeing here is, think about business capabilities your data is providing and not as an asset. So you would have, in segments, you have one or more capabilities, and together you have a bigger business capability, if you will. So what you're seeing now, translate that into how data sets and data products come into picture. A business application can produce one or more, can be producer of one or more data sets, and a data set, one or more data set can be part of a data product. And the data product can span across multiple domains. It doesn't have to be one domain. Yeah? Underwriting or finance. It, the finance, for example, domain product will span across multiple domains by the nature of it. So you, what data, when you talk about domain-driven data, it doesn't mean one business domain. A data product can span multiple domains. So um, now, how do they relate? So we, you, you heard of uh, uh, Chanu and Ram uh, talk about various capabilities. So one thing we have done is we basically, everything you're seeing here is contract-driven, meaning let's say you want to ingest data. It's transport independent. It's more related to design by contract, meaning today we use data sync. We also use um, S3 or Kinesis streams as a way to ingest data in near real time. As zero ETL comes in picture, we're looking into zero ETL as a way to accelerate ingestion of the data in near real time. So think about design by contract, interface, inter contract interfaces, and make it transport independent. Yeah? So that also includes your public data sets or external data sets. So basically what it provides is decoupling the management of data and technology by, by adopting data mesh as a principle. Yeah? And now you have integrated data products across which crosses domains making them more valuable. Yeah. Once you, uh, with the centralized data catalog, what you have is a, a um, enterprise-wide terminology to various data attributes. Now, discovery of the data, use of the data becomes simpler, basically enterprise logical data model. And now, you also, you have ownership. You have well-established ownership to the data sets or data products, which means upkeep, and SLA of those, there's some accountability to those data products. So now let's look at the various, uh, just to wrap up, various benefits. Basically, uh, what you have is ability to adopt new technologies, um, agility, so you can actually uh, come up to spare, uh, what you call, uh, improve your time to market, and horizontal scalability, because you're going to deal with petabyte scale data. Yeah? Um, and you have faster access to critical data when you need it because it's all about self-service. Now you can think about your, you have integrated ex data experience where you can visualize and leverage data across business domains rather than being siloed in one domain. Yeah? Now basically you have independence. Uh, if you want to switch out new technologies or adopt new technologies, you can do so. Because it is an innovative space, it is evolving, which means you should be able to adopt new technologies for any particular function. Yeah? And, uh, and uh, based on the domain, the, the type of work, the technology use will change based on the business domain. So what are we looking at is, uh, I mean, we have made a tremendous progress. We're continuing to adopt and accelerate um, adoption of uh, data mesh as a principle. We are looking into new technology, uh, technology. Architecture is a continuous process. We are looking into new technologies that will simplify um, our architecture, basically using data zones, AWS Glue, um, uh, AWS Bedrock. ML is an interesting one, uh, Redshift ML. So we have this one, one principle of bring compute to data, not data to compute. What I mean by that is, if you can think of Redshift ML and those kind of technologies, you're taking computer data, which means data you're eliminating need for data movement. So those are some of those new things we are uh, looking, exploring as well. And to improve our overall governance, you know, we have zero, zero trust as a fundamental need. 
um, and a principle. We are continuing to adopt zero trust principles to improve our overall data governance. So with the conclusions, I'm going to turn it on to uh, Ram. Come on. Thank you, Karen. It's always amazing to hear about our customers that are using the capabilities that we build uh, and, and, uh, and the innovations we build on their behalf. <clears throat> I want to make it sort of uh, the conclusion, keep the conclusion relatively short. Uh, you know, really the theme of this entire session was how to break down the data sil um, silos inside your organization and build solid data foundations using the comprehensive set of tools that AWS can provide, which helps you store and utilize your data helps you integrate the data across all the disparate data sources inside your organization cre to create a cohesive whole um, so you can understand your business and your customers and how you can govern your data. If you are participating in the Analytics Superhero sessions, uh, scan now so you get credit for attending this session. I'll keep it up for a couple of seconds in case you're doing it. Okay. Awesome. And that's the conclusion. Thank you. Uh, please be sure and uh, fill in the survey session.